Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Ellis, and I'm here today on behalf of the Wellness in Action Task Force. We are starting our pivotal podcast series. We all know that COVID-19 changed much about our lives and our work, but some of those changes may be helpful. In this interview series, we're hoping to have some people tell us about the changes they've had and made in their lives that might be helpful or seen as an opportunity to others. Today's podcast is called Seeing Life Through a Different Lens. Our interviewee is Dr. Ann Fulcher. Dr. Fulcher is our esteemed chair of radiology here at VCU, and she's an award-winning and incredible photographer. Let's listen as Dr. Ann Fulcher tells us the story of how COVID played out with her photography and shows us some of these beautiful images. Dr. Fulcher. Sure, thank you, Dr. Ellis. Well, again, I really appreciate your kind introduction and the invitation to, tra to share my experiences with what may be a, a very large and diverse group of individuals listening to this podcast. F for many years as a radiologist, I've had the pleasure of looking at images for a living. Then approximately nine years ago, I became interested in photography. And what started out as a hobby has evolved into an all-consuming passion. Perhaps for me, the most intriguing aspect of both medicine and photography is the need to engage in continuous learning with the goal of striving toward mastery of the craft, but actually never quite achieving complete mastery. Simply put, each trip I've taken, each photograph I've made, some of which we will talk about today, has served as a means to expand my own photographic experience and quite frankly, has improved my own personal wellness and hopefully that has spilled over into my work and job at VCU Health. So the major points I wanna talk about is let's just start out with my pathway to photography. It all started with a trip to the Galapagos Islands in Machu Picchu in 2011 or so. Now, this is an image from the Galapagos here. It shows a marine iguana. Now, recognizing that this had the potential to be the trip of a lifetime, I knew that my little point and shoot camera would not sufficiently capture the beauty of these places. Therefore, I began to research a digital SLR camera that would meet my needs. And after I settled on a particular camera and a lens, I sought the advice of a photographer, a professional photographer at VCU, may be known to you all, Alan Jones, an incredibly great person. And he actually agreed with my choice. So knowing absolutely nothing about digital SLR cameras, I purchased a book specifically about that camera. And as it turned off, it turned out, I had the next week off. So during that week, I studied the book at night and went out shooting each day, attempting to apply what I had learned the evening before. Now, fortunately for me, an introductory photography night class was being taught by a local pro photographer, Linda Richardson. She is a fantastic wildlife photographer here in Richmond at the University of Richmond. And it was actually beginning that week. So I, of course, immediately enrolled. And in fact, it was at that class that I found my love for photography. And I formed a re great relationship with Linda and also with another photographer there, David Everett, who has become my photo muse and mentor. He is a pro photographer in town whose focus is the James River. And he has taken me under his wing as a student. So with that as my foundation, I set out for the Galapagos Islands and Machu Picchu about six months later. And this is an image from the Galapagos Islands trip. These wonderful marine iguanas kind of hang out there in the sun, chill out, uh, get warm actually, rather than chilling out and really gives you a great opportunity. Uh, I love this old piece of driftwood that he was sitting on. And um, that was just one of my memorable pictures from this trip. I will tell you one of the things that strikes me most about photography is how, at least for me, maybe it's because I'm a radiologist and I enjoy looking at pictures. I can look at a photograph such as this and tell you exactly when it was taken, but more importantly, 
who I was traveling with, and also what I was feeling at the time. So this brings back memories that I would never have thought of. So what I do, in addition just to processing these images once I get home, for each trip that I take, I create a book, a hardcover book with blurb. I have no financial uh, connection with them, but that's who I use. And I now have many of these books and I can literally flip through them and relive the elements of the trip. So after the Galapagos, which was absolutely stunning, uh, our group moved on to Machu Picchu. And it's really kind of hard, even for a beginning photographer, to take a bad picture of Machu Picchu. But this was absolutely incredible. Um, I did not trek there on foot, as many have done. Uh, I took the, a train there and then a bus up a very tortuous road. And then Machu Picchu was there in front of us in all its splendid glory. Uh, the sun was absolutely perfect. And for a photographer, everything is about the light. And the clouds were dropping in behind this high altitude place. So it just really made for the memory of a lifetime. So with this trip, as my starting point, I was totally hooked. And at that point on, travel and photography became inseparable for me as a passion, but also hopefully as a way to share some of my experiences with other people. This is uh, another type of photography that I enjoy. It's a form of street photography or kind of impromptu photography, and not like the wildlife image you saw with the marine iguana and not like Machu Picchu, which is a classic landscape photograph. This is just somebody doing their thing in their little village in Peru. He did not even know I was there, but I love the juxtaposition of him against the classic Toyota truck here and he has his cowboy hat on and all photographers will tell you they love the color red in their photographs. So not only was it on his shirt, but also on the warning sticker on the back of the Toyota. So to me, this says small town in Peru. So I made sure I clicked it and moved on. That's beautiful. Well, as I said, this trip was just a springboard to my other adventures. And I have found that I am actually a pretty adventurous uh, traveler. And I will put a big plug in for my friend and colleague and physician, Dr. Michael Stevens in infectious disease here. He takes care of me in his outstanding travel clinic and makes sure that I am properly inoculated for and prepared for every trip I go to. So thank you, Mike, for everything that you've done for me. Uh, this is from a fairly recent trip, just last summer. Imagine how quickly things can change in a year. I had no thought about hopping on that plane in Richmond, going to Atlanta, Atlanta to Anchorage, Anchorage on a very small plane that landed on the beach in Lake Clark National Park. Uh, and uh, there I stayed at a lodge, uh, very, very remote, accessible only by uh, float plane or airplane uh, for about five days and had the privilege of getting up close to and photographing these magnificent grizzly bears. And many people have said, my gosh, you must have a super long lens. Well, it wasn't so much the long lens. It's what you see in this photograph here the salmon were running like nobody's business. So because these bears have such a plentiful food supply at Lake Clark, they're really not interested in consuming human beings. And we actually could get very, very close to them all the while making sure we did not disturb their habitat or their peace. But they really did not care that we were there. The picture that was just shown was that of a mother grizzly fishing for her uh, three cubs uh, near sunset. And these are two of those cubs. And what was amazing about this, they were just like children in their interactions. They were envious of one another. They wanted the other's toy, or in this case, the salmon. And there was a great amount of love and emotion shown between these cubs and their mother. It was just absolutely amazing to me. So really the experience of a lifetime and I will go back again and again and again as the opportunity arises. Wow. So here's in, I think this one is not in the same place, but I'm sure has another different story. 
Absolutely yeah. not. This was in an equally remote but different part of the world. This was taken in a place that has no name. Uh, this is a young male polar bear that was taken in Manitoba, Canada. For this, I flew into Churchill and then took a small fixed wing plane 125 kilometers southeast of Churchill where there is nothing there but a lodge and five people who run the lodge. So we flew into uh, a sandy runway, got out of the plane and went into the lodge and stayed there for about five or six days. Likewise, at this place, we had incredible guides, uh, great experience with the animals. We did not disturb them and they did not disturb us, but we were able to have some close encounters, but felt very protected and at the same time, very respectful of their environment and their habitat. Many people have said to me that they have never seen a polar bear without ice and snow around them. Well, this is what happens uh, around the end of August or so in Manitoba, Canada. There is no snow. Uh, my first trip to this uh, very cold place, I wanted to start out when it was not all that cold and see if I could tough it out there, and I did. And so uh, next year I have a, a true trip to the Arctic uh, planned, but this was uh, incredible. These bears were up close and personal. This one mugged for the camera. Uh, he loved it, he loved us, and he just gave us some spectacular poses. So this is all truly in the wild, nothing planned and nothing baited at any time. It's just amazing that you can get that kind of a shot with this. And you're right, what a great mug. <laughs> I think. Moving on to another place, and I'm sure another great story. Yeah, well, in addition to wildlife photography, which I absolutely love, I also like street photography and more classical travel photography. And what I try to do in some photographs is have that photograph stand alone and tell a story. And this was a temple that I visited in India in February and March of 2018. And this is the high priest of this temple. And you might think that someone like him would be very standoffish, but in fact, he knew our guide. They went to elementary school together. So he was telling us all about the shenanigans that they had when they were elementary school. So he was very welcoming, but he was the high priest of this very, very large temple in the middle of a bustling area of India. And uh, he was there doing his duty. Uh, we happened to be there during Holi, which is the Indians celebration of spring or the welcoming of new life. And that is why you see uh, smudges of yellow and pink paint uh, on the floor and on the temple and also on his feet. We were there during Holy Week. And uh, as a matter of fact, I participated in a holy um, celebration where this powdery paint was thrown everywhere. And yes, I did have a covering for my camera and my eyes. <laughs> but it was a fantastic experience. Uh, from the bustling cities of India, we then traveled far out uh, into the Thar Desert. This is right on the border of Pakistan, and it was amazing to see the landscape change and also the mentality change. As we approached this area, we saw many armed guards, but we felt very safe. Uh, we went into the desert near sunset, and there was this um, camel herder and his camel there. Uh, the sun was absolutely perfect. Uh, it was a little bit bright and I thought he was in shadow. So I said, gosh, instead of trying to capture the specific details of both the man and his camera, let's put him in silhouette. So uh, this is um, that image. And uh, this is one image that has uh, done very well. It uh, was awarded um, image of the year for the camera club here in Richmond. Wow. Uh, but again, the most important thing to me is not that, but that it captured for me the memories of everything that was going on at this particular moment in time. It's like everything else. The story is what you covet. And that's definitely comes out in this because you learn so much more when you know the story behind it. I'm sure it makes the memories just solid for you as well. 
This, is this was year. toward the end of the trip to India. And any really good photographer will know that sometimes you have to trespass on other people's property to get the great picture. So our guide who knew a lot of people in the Agra region for a long time, um, helped us out with this. So we left the hotel, got on a small van, got off the small van and got into small two person tuk-tuks that took us to the back of a farmer's field that we probably weren't totally supposed to be on. But again, the God had arranged this for us. We walked about a mile or so. And when we came out, we came out on the backside of the Taj Mahal. And this is one of the things you want to think about with photography. Everybody has the front picture of the Taj Mahal, but do they have the picture behind the Taj Mahal and do they have it at the right time of day? So we were there when it was still almost dark and we stood in the water here on a little sandbar hoping that the dense fog would lift and that the sun would come in and sure enough both of those things happened and uh, the birds flew into the photograph just as i was taking this picture so nothing about this was composited or added this is literally how it was at the time and at one point I thought, wouldn't it have been great if the young man leading the camel had on traditional clothes, but actually I was more pleased that he had on modern clothes because it allowed us to place that picture in time. It wasn't from however long ago, it was from a young boy who's working in this area right now. Yeah. Wow. So this was, this was a dream shot. It's some of those images that you even remember your camera settings and who was standing next to you. Um, and, yeah. and, you, and I had literally about five seconds to either make this work or not. You know, it's interesting because you get this image in your head that, oh gosh, she must have had to stand there for hours getting everything all set up just perfect. And to hear that, you know, you had to just take it as it came and it came out so beautifully. Like, how could you possibly ever ask for those birds to come across right at that point in time? It's just, that's just amazing, isn't it? Well, and I think that's one of the things about photography. And there are so many lessons of photography that can be applied to life. Um, you can't always wait for the perfect minute. You have to be out there and let the perfect minute come to you. And some days it does, and some days it doesn't. Right. Uh, this was um, an add-on that I did to the trip to India because I really had it in my head that I had to photograph a tiger in the wild. Uh, so I added on a three-day excursion to Rantham Boar, and um, we had two crazy guides. I, I thought at times that I would not return from the trip, actually, because they drove like mad on these rocky... Um, ill-repaired roads that dropped off into an abyss on one side, but they were intent on getting me to the tigers. So when they heard that a tiger was in a certain area, they floored it and got us there. And I have never been bumped around so much in my life, but this male tiger came out of the woods. He had been uh, uh, enjoying a mud bath, as you can see here, and he was kind of licking his chops, not at us, but he was just doing his tiger thing. Uh, so this was an, an incredible experience. Uh, this was actually a well-known tiger in Rantham Boar. It's a protected area. Uh, so there are only a certain number of people that can go in every day and they have zones. So only so many people can go into a zone every day. And that way the tigers are not disturbed. Uh, this was the well-known female tiger Arrowhead. Uh, you can't really see it on her forehead, but that's how she got her name. It kind of looks like her markings look like an arrowhead. So as soon as she appeared, our guide said, oh my gosh, there's Arrowhead. And she had just given birth to three cubs, which we did not see, um, but she was hunting here. And she made a kill in front of us. It was a small deer. And I asked our guide, oh my gosh, because we had only been out for 20 minutes on the first day when this happened. I said, how often does that happen? And he said, almost never. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, really, it was in, in his experience, it was, it occurs in about one out of every 100 outings. 
So this was our first day. I went into Rantham Bore with the idea that I may spend three days photographing nothing because that can absolutely happen. You go out and you spend time and you spend money and the tigers don't appear. And that's just part of the deal. But for me, at least, it worked out great. Over the course of two and a half days, we had over 12 different sightings of tigers, most of which were up close. Wow, that is amazing. How about that? That's now, beautiful. in addition to India, one place I absolutely love is Africa. I have been there now four times, first to Botswana, then to Tanzania. Third trip was to Namibia, which is shown here. This is the Susus Vlei uh, Desert, or the Susus Vlei area. And um, again, it was kind of like the tiger. I had it in my head about the image I wanted to capture. Uh, I'd seen it in a National Geographic about six years before, and I said, I gotta go there. So this is exactly the reason I went to Namibia. Uh, but Namibia turned out to be a wonderful adventure. But this is one of the images that is classic. These trees are thousands of years old. Uh, they are petrified or at least they're dead and they are so dry there that things don't decay. So, and, and the sky is so uh, blue, it's amazing. Uh, there's absolutely no humidity there. And this whole area changes against these enormous dunes with respect to light um, all day long. So again, we were racing to get there as the park opened, but before the light became too harsh. And I wanted this side light that you see there where the, the trees are casting shadows rather than any harsh light at midday. So some of these things you really have to plan out and you also have to have someone get you there. Our driver knew exactly what she was doing. We passed probably five or six cars that were stalled out in the sand and we were zipping by because she knew how to drive it and she knew the vehicle to use. Wow, the blue is just incredible, isn't it? The, the color is, is just phenomenal. Well, this was truly a dream come true for me. And I think photographers do have ideas about what they want to capture. Sometimes that's a good idea and sometimes it can be a little disappointing when it doesn't work. But for me, planning out time, time of year, time of day is absolutely crucial. Uh, you can't control the weather elements, but you can control some things. So um, plan it as much as you can. This was also from Namibia. This was uh, a relatively young lion napping with uh, three of her buddies. Uh, behind these grasses. Even our guide didn't see this. One of my friends who was traveling with me said, hey, there are lions over there. And he backed up the, uh, the Land Rover. And sure enough, we just sat there while the beautiful late afternoon sun bounced off of the, not only the lion, but off of these um, grasses. And I was trying very hard to focus on her eyes and keep the grasses out of focus. Wow, just gorgeous. This is from a relatively recent trip in May 2019 to Morocco. Uh, this is the bread maker for the inn where I stayed. In order to reach this end, we had about in, we had about a two mile rough hike up a mountainside. You could either hike it yourself or ride on one of the donkeys that was carrying your luggage. And after I took a look at those donkeys, I said, I, I think I'll just do this myself. Uh, so this was good. It, the, the inns there are called Cospas, and she was the bread maker of the Cospa. She showed us how she made the bread, and she did not mind at all if we took her picture. She did not speak English, uh, so I just managed to get in front of her, and I just love the way that she, she kind of danced around the fire without any injury whatsoever. I figured she had done this a few times before. <laughs> I imagine so. She looks very intent on her work too. Yeah, she was very interesting. Uh, the, the Moroccan guide that we had spoke with her. She had no idea when she was born, how old she was. Uh, oh. She had just worked there as a bread maker for a very long time. Great. Uh, what about this? Things, yeah, one of the things I like to do is, is mix it up. Uh, not get too much in a rut with anything, but particularly with photography. So one of my um, loves is actually night photography. Uh, and 
there's a great deal of creativeness that you can do here. We had taken uh, somewhat of a bumpy ride uh, from um, Southern Florida, uh, from the um, Biscayne National Park there. Uh, that park is, I think, about 90% underwater, and there are some islands around and about that you can take boats to. So we took a small boat there one night, and this is a lighthouse. It's not a functional lighthouse. It's a man-made lighthouse for ornamental reasons, but it was open. And what we did, because it was completely dark, we had our shutters open, and we were actually painting the light onto this lighthouse with flashlights. We also put a few small tea lights and flashlights in the windows. And of course, the light at top was the natural light from the lighthouse. And as we were beginning to break down this shot with just the door open, there was a gentleman standing to the right of me. And I said, hey, Gary, do a favor for me. Before we break this down, go in there and stand in the doorway. You can't move because the shutter is going to be open for 30 seconds and strike an intimidating pose. So uh, he did, and I clicked the shutter, and this was the result. And uh, this has been a, a very successful image for me. It has sold, and it's also uh, fortunately won some awards. But again, that's not what I'm after. I'm just after new experiences and light painting for this and photographing in pitch black is just a, a completely different twist on photography. Wow, I would have never guessed that 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 was how you photographed that and it, that, that's just amazing. It is just truly amazing. Um, well, it is, it is hanging in one of our colleagues offices here. Oh, that's I'm great. On the podcast, but uh, he purchased this. Great. And I'm sure that yeah, um, as we go through to the end, um, maybe we'll be able to talk about how you can share your work and people can see it or you know, have uh, time to look at it themselves as well. Maybe we'll be able to put that information in here too. Happy to do so. Okay. This is incredible. And this was another dream I had, and that was to photograph jaguars in the wild. Their markings are like leopards that you see in Africa but these are huge animals. If you just take a look at that forearm and shoulder, these are incredibly muscular creatures. Uh, this was taken in the Pantanal region of Brazil. This area of Brazil is underwater, and I do mean really underwater, about six feet or so um, for much of the year. However, in July, it dries out, and because of that, the jaguars and other wildlife need to come down to the river to hunt. Um, they are not at all dangerous as long as you stay in your boat. Uh, and we were in a very small boat here. It was um, uh, driven by a Portuguese guide who did not speak English, but he did speak jaguar. And he could see jaguars that we were like, what, what are you talking about? And he would race off in his boat and said, it's down there. And, you know, you kind of have whiplash after he, he hits the throttle. Uh, but uh, he gets you to the Jaguar. And sure enough, uh, here she was uh, coming at us over the course of about five days. We had over 25 separate Jaguar sightings. And these are just incredible uh, animals. Uh, you can see from the fur here that it's wet. And uh, Jaguars are fantastic swimmers. So they will swim from one part of the river to the other, and they feed uh, sometimes on the caiman there, as well as the capybaras, which are ginormous rodents. They're the, the largest rodent in the world, I believe. Uh, but yeah, they're, and we've watched them hunt, and uh, one jaguar got in a tree and posed for us. Jaguars almost never get in trees in contrast to leopards. So she uh, managed to strike a pose just long enough. And our guide put the boat right underneath her limb so that we could get a, a fantastic image of that. So again, I just feel so honored to have been close to so much of this wildlife. And these jaguars are all protected. Again, we were all there obeying the rules of the preserve uh, and they're part of a jaguar project. And when we went back to the lodge, um, one of the gods was there and they said, oh yeah, we, we track all of these jaguars based on their markings. Oh, you just made a photograph of ginger. So this was, the, and they all have names. 
And if you are the person who identifies the Jaguar for the first time, you get to name the Jaguar. <laughs> that's wonderful. Wow. I, I, I would never have thought that that's where you were positioned when you took this. You would, have, you would think that somebody's got a huge you know, telescopic lens that they're moving in on. Um, and it's just so interesting to hear how the guides are able to move you through. Sounds like they're really talented um, people that really help to make it happen for you. They are truly the key to the trip. No wow. question about it. So I'm sure, I mean, with all of these places, you had to travel um, far and wide and wonderful travels, I'm sure, but you had to travel far and wide. And now we come to 2020 where travel has come to an incredible halt. And that's a little of what we wanted to talk about today, too, is saying, how did you, um, how did you cope and how did you move into doing something that was uh, going to fulfill your mastered craft with this and show what you've been doing now? And I, I've got this one that I'll just show up here as you talk about kind of that transition into what we have here. Well, that's a great question. Uh, Dr. Ellis, and I think it's really pertinent to all of us right now. Uh, our lives have changed, and either you can be down about that, or you can say, okay, our lives have changed, and what can I do with this new scenario? And um, quite frankly, it changed dramatically for me. On February uh, 29th, I was scheduled to be on a plane leaving Washington, D.C. for Borneo, flying through South Korea. And on February 24th, when COVID was becoming somewhat of a reality, but not maybe so much here, we were beginning to think about it very seriously. The CDC issued a level three warning for South Korea, which is the airport that I was flying through to get to Borneo. And it was for only essential travelers. There was no way that I could rebook through any other place. And I wasn't really sure I wanted to rebook through mm -hmm. any other place because I was concerned that if I came back, I would be quarantined maybe outside of the United States and uh, almost certainly outside of VCU. So I canceled that trip. It was very sad. I was going to photograph orangutans there in the wild. That is only one of two places in the world where orangutans occur, but I figured they will probably be there a few years from now at least. Uh, so I canceled the trip. And I said, well, what can I do? Well, we have the beautiful James River here. And this is an eagle uh, that I photographed from the James River from a boat. Uh, the boat uh, is captained by someone right here in Richmond. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of the presentation, I referenced Linda Richardson, the pro photographer that uh, taught me my first class. Well, her husband owns uh, Discover the James and he takes small groups out on the James River, and I was on his boat. Uh, and this is a picture that I captured. Uh, these eagles are incredible. Uh, they're kind of like the jaguars in Brazil. They all have names, or at least the resident eagles do, and they have made an enormous comeback along the James. So even though travel is fantastic, I think we really have to step back and say, hey, we have some really wonderful things here in our own city and uh, in the surrounding counties. So this was my, my attempt to capture some of that beauty here at home. Wow. Uh, but you're quite right. COVID changed so many things and it even changed the ability to go down to the James River. Uh, his, his ability to do that was uh, on lockdown like everything else for so long. And I said, my gosh, after working all day trying to figure out uh, nuances and algorithms to take care of patients in radiology with COVID, uh, I can't go to the gym, I can't travel, what am I going to do? And I really needed to truly preserve my own wellness. So I said, okay, I've got a patio and I will put flowers out there. I live near um, some water, so maybe some birds will come back there. And it was springtime, of course, and uh, so many flowers were blooming uh, naturally, but also they were blooming in the grocery store. And I would never tell you I have a green thumb, 
So uh, I had to make several trips to the grocery store to, to get some of these flowers. But I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do with my time. So I think you've probably included a few of those pictures. Yes. That I'm happy to talk through. Yep, I wanted to uh, show that the, this is just incredible how you captured um, keeping your mastered craft alive and well and just it just beautiful ways, just incredible. Well, this was taken from my patio. Uh, I, I love color and I love contrast. And this beautiful male goldfinch complied with my, my desires there. I had purchased these uh, purple cone flowers specifically for the reason of hopefully attracting birds. And uh, he flew in one late afternoon and I was able to uh, capture him as he just perched there for a few moments. And I love bird photography anyway, but I had never photographed any birds here at home, other than maybe an eagle on the river or a, a great blue heron. Uh, and it just makes you think, gosh, we've got a lot of wildlife right here. You really don't have to go to Africa to see some of these things. So again, just trying to make the best that I could of the situation that we're in. Uh, the other thing I did, as I alluded to, I uh, was started um, close up flower photography. I will tell you, I had never taken a picture of a flower, but I had said to one of my friends, I said, you know, if I ever break a leg and can't uh, travel or you know, get old and it's too really dangerous to do some of this stuff, I'm gonna figure out macro photography or close up photography. And then COVID hit and I said, well, I guess that time has arrived. So I, I looked on one of the major camera sites where I buy and they had a macro or close-up lens on sale for 50% off. And I can tell you, having bought some camera equipment, that never happens. And uh, I don't know if it was an overstock or what, I didn't really care. I ordered it, I knew absolutely nothing about this. So um, when I finished my work uh, in the evenings, I looked at probably 100 or so YouTube videos on close-up photography and uh, kind of taught myself how to do it. Someone at, said to me one day, this must have been shot in a studio. And I said, well, I don't have a studio. And this time uh, it was so early in COVID that the only place I was going to was work. I wasn't even going to the grocery store. So I couldn't really buy the things I needed. So to create this black background, uh, this is my black raincoat um, that you see. And this was shot on my kitchen counter. And as some of my friends joke, uh, finally you found a use for your kitchen because you never cook. Uh, so true enough. And so this was shot with a handheld light, uh, camera on a tripod, the black background was my raincoat. And um, so I started off with flower photography in my kitchen. Wow, that's just a great story. If you could see my uh, smile on my face as you're telling us about the black raincoat, that's just wonderful. Um, you know, I'm gonna show the, the last couple of pictures here, the photos here, um, but you know, in the very beginning, you talked about we're at an academic learning center and that lifelong learning is so important to you, but the message that I hear too from you is you can really start this anytime. You, and that people really can take a hold of what their dreams are. And, and you started this, did you say nine years ago? Yeah, or? about nine years ago in 2011. That's really amazing. If you have somebody that is just starting out and wants to do something like this, what do you, what do you recommend for the newcomer to photography? Well, I would kind of recommend uh, a, a bit of what I did, kind of think about what you want to do. If it's travel photography, if you're a hiker and uh, you know, you're climbing mountains, you are going to probably purchase a different type of camera than if you're just going short distances to photograph a bird in a marsh. Uh, some of these cameras can be pretty heavy. And over the course of those nine years, camera technology has changed dramatically where you can get really good cameras that are basically the size of what used to be point and shoot cameras. They're mirrorless cameras. Uh, because they do not have a mirror in them, they are much lighter. 
Uh, I have not transitioned to that, but that's certainly something you can do. Uh, the next thing I would do is uh, not really think that you can go out and click the shutter and everything's going to be perfect. Uh, you have to really learn the camera. And the second piece you want to do is learn composition. And then just take images over and over and over. Um, early on in the presentation, I said that a uh, pro photographer in town who is my friend and has kind of generously taken me under his wing, David Everett, um, that's an example of what I would recommend. It's a lot like sports. If you continue to play whatever sport, maybe tennis, with someone that is just as good as you are, or maybe not quite as good, your skills are not going to bump up as quickly. Uh, go out there and play with someone, compete against someone who's better than you. And actually, I continue to do that. Uh, just last January, I joined the Virginia Professional Photographers Association because I want to compete against people who are pros. And uh, it takes you to another level. It helps you think to think about things as they are. And I, I'm very hesitant to boast about anything, but I will share with you something that happened this week. I entered their summer contest. Uh, it was a statewide competition among pros, and I placed second. Mm. Uh, so it, it, it's one of those things that is it, not untouchable or not reachable. Uh, you can really do these things, but I really strongly, strongly advocate finding someone who is really good at it to critique your work. Even now, when I come back from a trip, I do my own processing, cropping, everything. But then I call David and I say, let me purchase a couple of hours of your time and I want you to critique everything that I do and be harsh. Mm. And he does. And then you learn from that experience and the mistakes that you make, hopefully you don't make again. Right. So that would be my advice. All right. Well, you gotta tell us about this because I'm sure that this is probably as well from close to home. Yes, this was shot from the, um, lawn furniture on my patio. Uh, these are little bluebirds that have populated the woods behind my house. Uh, so I got a log from the woods and propped it up on something. And I have mealworms out there. And this is a male bluebird feeding his young. Uh, they have just fledged at this point. It was early July. And this little bird would look at the mealworms on the log and not eat them. So the dad would bend down, pick them up, put them in his mouth. And it was funny, over the course of several days, he would no longer do that. He was making the, the young one do its own thing. So there are three in this little family. And even though we're now into August, the family still visits as a unit. And uh, they come to the backyard every day. But this was just wonderful for me because it was happening right there. I couldn't have hope, hoped for anything better, and it was only a few feet away from me rather than 3,000 miles across the earth. Wow. So it was, it was a, a wonderful um, event. Gal, it, it's beautiful. And, you know, I, I think you also mentioned that we can't always plan everything because uh, you just don't know when that's going to happen and that that bird is really going to do that. And life just keeps continuing to throw us curveballs and and keeps changing and we have to figure out how we adapt and 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 move and change into continuing to enjoy and find our wellness in ways that we can adapt and change too and it sounds like that's what you've done because i'm sure that this is um a, a craft that you've mastered you've learned you've read about but i'm sure it's it's a huge part of your wellness, I would guess. Is that right? It absolutely is, Dr. Ellis. And, and I you're, you're very kind to say I have mastered it. I, I am most certain that I have not, uh, but I, I strive to. And it, is, it gives you a balance, particularly, I think, for people who are in the medical field, you kind of need something that, at least for me, is very different than what you do in the daytime. And for me, it has also allowed me to meet people who are not healthcare professionals and see how they think in ways differently 
than we do in the medical profession. So it's, it's just been a fantastic um, diversion in so many different ways. And um, it gives me pleasure. Again, as I mentioned, I've sold a few things. That is by no means uh, my intent. My intent is really just to enjoy this. And if I can bring a little bit of happiness to someone else, um, I do that. Right. And this is uh, one of the most beautiful photographs that I've seen that is um, your gift to us is really helping everybody else's wellness as well. But it's really showing us that we can stop and change and, and figure out how we pivot and do things in a different way. And I'm hoping and I, and I think most positively, this is going to help other people say, um, I, can do, I can do something like that right from my own house. And um, I really thank you. Our, our task force thanks you. Um, I imagine that we will get people that want to be able to see the, your pictures and and where, where can we direct them to? Um, can we? Sure. Um, everything I have is um, very open to other people. Uh, I post almost every day, not quite every day, almost every day on Instagram. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm very straightforward, so I don't have any funny little name there. It's just at Ann Fulcher Photography, and that's Ann without an E, A N N F U L C H E R Photography on Instagram. And um, my website is Ann Fulcher Photography, no spaces, no dots, um, dot com. And I will tell you from the outset, the, um, the web page is not necessarily as professional as it could or should be. I just don't really have time for that. Uh, it's a place where it's a repository for my images so that I have them there. And sometimes a friend will say, you know, I really want to go to India what does that look like or what is it like? And I said, okay, just, just go to my website and you can see it there. Um, just this week, um, a, a wall opened up at Crossroads Art Center and um, I rented that wall for a year and uh, I have just finished installing about um, seven flower photography images here that uh, all were made, everything on the wall was made during COVID and uh, two bird photographs. So that's now across from the front desk at Crossroads Art Center in the West End. So if anyone wants to take a look there, and I also have some images online with them as well. That's fabulous. And I'm, um, if it's okay, I'm gonna put those couple of uh, sites and places um, on a slide at the end of this so that others can see it. And of course, we'll be posting this video on our wellness webpage that goes up on the intranet and, um, we hope uh, that we get to see more in the years to come and also we get to see orangutan at some point in time um, we'll look forward to that but thank you really thank you so much from the bottom of my heart dr fulcher for spending this time with us and but for mostly sharing this incredible work um i just really think you've got an incredible gift and the gift is now shared with so many people thank you dr ellis thank you uh, I, I never had thought about doing a podcast until you sent me a note. I am happy to do it and uh, to share uh, whatever I can with other people. But I, I will just underscore that, um, you know, part of this, I just want to express my gratitude for you for doing this, but also um, my thankfulness for having been able to travel previously. I hope that I can in the future, but also my gratefulness for all of these things that surround us really in our own backyards. Right. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, everybody else, for um, taking the time to uh, enjoy this. And I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.